Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shred Hour. I'm your host, Al, and this may be an occurring theme. I know Michael Lofton has Comedy Hour. Um, I don't want to do that. I want my own thing. So I'm going to start Shred Hour. Shred Hour. Um, I was thinking of doing a video responding to Mr. Ubi Petrus, but uh, I'll have to have him on an another Shred Hour. I wasn't going to make a, a, a video response to something he said. But today, the one who will be shredded is James White. Now, you uh, might want to know, uh, probably know James White, famous promoter of Calvinism. Let me just retweet my tweet live. Exclamation mark. I like to put three exclamation marks. Okay, so, Shred Hour. Now, um, yesterday, only yesterday, I happened to be just uh, going through YouTube, and I noticed the dividing line was live. It's either yesterday or the day before. I think it was yesterday. And I'm like, let me just see what James White's talking about. So I turn, I click it, and he's up, and he's just starting a new segment. And the new segment is Pope Honorius. Ooh. Now, for those who don't know what that is, it's his favorite argument against papal infallibility. Uh, I don't know why he uses this argument. He's been shredded on this prior, and we're going to shred him again today. Um, it's not a good argument. On the surface, it's a good argument, but once you dig a little deep, it's the last argument you want to use, believe me. So, uh, hello, Tom. I don't know how to say hello in Albanian, but um, but God bless you, brother, and God bless you, Eli. So, and he just did a thing on Pope Honorius. Not only did he not do a an actual like 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 uh, uh, an in depth refutation, he has had no knowledge in the last twenty years. He got shredded on this in I think two thousand or two thousand one by Doctor Sengenis, and basically he had debated Tim Staples about six months prior. Then he debated. And he did a lot better against Tim Staples. And then he debates Syngenis, then Syngenis blows him out of the water. And then the argument Syngenis shredded, he's just re repeating. He's never given a refutation of Syngenis' argument. He just parrots the, well, he gave a different argument than Staples. And if you watch that debate, you could probably find it online. It's pretty entertaining because he's like, well, that's not what the last apologist used. It's unfair. I don't know how to respond to your argument. I knew how to respond to his, but yours is... Anyway. So, we're going to show you... First of all, I have to show you that we can't take White seriously as an apologist. I'll tell you why. One, because he hasn't done his research. He does not read the primary sources. And... uh let me just show you something. Share screen. Uh, we're going to show you that James White is... Okay, can you, can you see this on StreamYard? Yes, you can. Okay. All right. The, the main book to read... Oh, wait. Hold on. Let's go. Oh, no. No. Sorry. Okay, the main book you need to read on uh, papal infallibility is this. The Gift of Infallibility, the Relatio by Bishop Gasser, that the Pope, Pius IX, had him write a document on what the Council taught. You need to do this. This uh, document is even quoted in Vatican II. So it's very, very uh, important. And like, for example, if, 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 if I consider myself a serious critic of communism, I've, I'd have had to read all their key documents, the, uh, like the communist manifesto, say I hadn't read the communist manifesto and I'm saying all this stuff about communism, you, you're like, how can we take you seriously when you haven't read the documents? This is what you need to read to be an expert. 
on Vatican One and papal infallibility. Has James White read this book? Uh, let's let's go to here. All right, um, let's look. All right, the 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 bishop's name is Gasser. Well, wait, wait. Before we do this, let's. He gets all of his stuff from an Anglican scholar named George Salmon. George Salmon. Let's see how much we got here. I've searched George Salmon. That's the the old Anglican he uses. Look at all these. Look at all these search results. Then you look up Gasser. And oh, nothing. Where is this all? Relatio. Okay, but it's not to do with papal infallibility. It's to do with all this stuff. But no, there's uh, nothing on papal infallibility. He hasn't read the Relatio. And it's not an expensive book either. You just go and you can pick up this book. It's like... Twenty dollars on Amazon. In uh, that's in Canadian dollars. In American dollars, it's probably like fifteen. It's a very cheap book. Sh let me see. Uh, shred hour made me think legit of guitar shredding. No, it's James White shredding. That's what's going on. Anyway, the point is, James White hasn't read the documents he needs to read. Therefore, he can't be considered a legit apologist on this stuff. Um, he claims to be an expert. He's like, I taught church history. Guys, if you learned your church history from James White, you need to forget everything and start reading primary sources like Eusebius, um, Socrates, Sozomen, Evagrius Scholasticus, because James White has just read 19th century Protestants, hasn't checked their sources, and that's why he won't debate Catholics anymore because we've researched all his stuff. Look at... um. Tony Costa used all of James White's arguments against the Immaculate Conception against William Albrecht. And William Albrecht's like, have you checked the source for that? Have you checked the source? No. It's like, well, they're all fake. You can't trust it. So, all right. Now, we are going to get into a debate. Like I said, I turned on James White yesterday, and he was just starting a new segment on Pope Honorius. Pope Honorius. Let's see. Um, let's add him to the screen. Them. All right. Oh, there we go. Let's uh, let's dive into something that you never expected um, expected today. Um, oh, by the way, by the way, James White. This like fourteen or so minutes in. If you go back and listen to the first fourteen minutes, they were really good. He was talking about politics. James White should only talk about politics. Anyway. <clears throat> How many people do you, how many Roman Catholics do you think, now that was a nice transition. Notice I paused for a moment. Ooh, so the paused. dividing line highlights guys can get a nice clean break on that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know that. Oh. No. Uh, I was, I was just, just saying, we've got to, we've got to start following. He's starting to take forever too. This is what Tovia Singer does. He, he'll, he'll take, um, of course, Tovia Singer is that uh, blasphemous rabbi, the hater of God and all that is good, uh, piece of human waste, Tovia Singer. Uh, he takes forever. He says stuff that, like, things that he'll say in 15 minutes that could be said in two minutes because he keeps talking in circles. And, and James White, I don't think he's as bad as... Um, Rabbi Tovia Singer here, but he's pretty bad. Let's watch. And and linking to all, because I, I think a lot of people, if we linked to those shorter versions, I think a lot of people would watch them. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I, I do appreciate the, the hard work that the, you guys, gals, whoever you are, um, you, you do a great job. Notice the break again. Notice the break again. Get on so, with it. I wonder how many Roman Catholics in the world today would know who Pope Honorius was. Pope Honorius. Probably almost none, unless they're history geeks or apologists. I mean, let's uh, let's be honest here. M most, uh, if you ask an average Catholic, um, who was prior to Francis? Well, Pope Benedict. Who was prior to Pope Benedict? Well, that was Pope John Paul. Who was prior to John Paul? 
It's like, uh, they may know John Paul one, but like prior to John Paul one, they don't know anything, you know? Uh, it's, it's unfortunate really. I actually had, um, a, uh, an image, but I, I decided not to pull it over here because obviously no one really has a meaningful image of Pope Honorius, but, hmm. uh, Pope Honorius was Bishop of Rome in the seventh century. And he had uh, a fair amount of communication and written correspondence. Could you talk any slower, Dr. White? With Sergius, who was, I believe, uh, the Archbishop of Constantinople. So a patriarch, uh, meaningful uh, leader in the uh, Eastern Church. Yep. And there's a long history of correspondence. It sort of breaks down a bit after 1054, but there, there's a lot of interaction. Much can be said about that, but not today. Action that took place definitely over the, over the centuries, which is uh, interesting in and of itself. Anyways, Pope Honorius, I, I, want you to, I, I want you to go back in history with me, all right? Pope Honorius and Sergius have a, dis a written discussion over the difference between duothelitism and monothelitism. It's not dual, it's d diothelitism. Anyway, the point is, yeah, it's, it's an interesting debate. It's not something the average Christian thinks about. Now, let's be honest. The vast majority of us were not thinking about monothelitism or duothelitism. We went to bed last night or when we got up this morning. And in fact, the vast majority of us have not really thought much about that subject. And in fact, the vast majority of us, if we were to honest, be honest, would say, I don't. Well, let's let me give a bit of a, a history here. Uh, since the, uh, the, uh, the the Council of Chalcedon, actually technically since the Robert Council of Ephesus, you had the Monophysites, and the Monophysites were in the Eastern Church, but they refused to be Chalcedonian, especially uh, Severus of Antioch, really attacks Chalcedon. And the, the whole point is, the whole point is, in the, the Eastern Church, you had two churches. In the, the West, it was all Catholic. In the East, it was Catholic. Then you had these monophysites and these monophysites were uh kind of a fifth column because the R roman emperor basically had the view that they were the head of the church and and and, and it's like one empire one emperor one faith and you can't have two churches you can't have the catholics and the monophysites you have to have the catholic church only and they tried to be the head of that church, even though the Pope was head of the church with his college. But um, yeah, so that's, and there were many ways to do that. You had the Henoticon in the early sixth century that caused the Acacian schism. You had uh, Justinian and the whole three chapters thingy. That was technically, that was, although he was doing something he shouldn't have done, that was technically theologically correct. The, the Henotikon just watered down the truth. It was a compromise. The Monothelites was the same thing. Emperor Heraclius got this from a bishop. I can't remember the bishop's name. It's in a chronicle I got over there. Uh, chronicle St. Theophanes the Confessor. And so that's the problem there. Um, and it's a compromise. It's like, can't we all unite under this one banner of this compromised theology? I understand where they're coming from, but anyway, that's what monothelitism is. It was a way to synthesize the Catholics and the monophysites, saying Christ had one will. Anyway. I don't have a clue what that is about. Oh. And 99 plus percent of all Christians have lived and died on this planet without having any idea. Not if you lived in the seventh century. In fact, I'm going to be talking about a council, the Lateran Council of 649. So, but basically, if you lived outside the century, though, it's it's a pretty meaningless debate. What monothelitism is, whether it's true or fa false, what duothelitism is, you can sort of tell mono duo. Okay, it's not the same thing. 
And thelitism, mm, fellow means I will. So it has something to do with the will. But most of us, this is not a part of what might be called practical theology. It's not something that is going to impact almost any decision you make today. And so if Honorius and Sergius were a little off base on that particular subject, well, does that really mean much of anything? No. Does that, is that going to have any type of eternal consequence to it? Now, prior to the Vatican Council that met toward the end of the 19th century. And by the way, all of his information from the Vatican Council, it's not from Catholic writings, it's not from the Relatio, it's not from Cardinal Manning or Cardinal Newman or anyone like that. It's from um, 19th century Protestants, like Schaff, like Salmon. Uh, like, well, I don't know if Salmon is. Anyway, the point is, it's not from Catholics. Vatican I, not Vatican II, which was in the 20th century. But prior to the first Vatican Council, if you had raised the belief, if you raised the idea that the Bishop of Rome, in his specific person, had a charism of infallibility. Oh, here we go. To where he and he alone would not be able to lead the church into error. Honorius didn't lead the church in error. It was private correspondence, and the, the pope after him was a diothelite. He didn't lead the church into error anyway, or bind the church uh, to error. Not that he himself might not have wrong ideas, but that he would not lead the church into error. Hasn't happened. Not with the Norris, not with anyone. That was defined at the First Vatican Council. Amen. Doctrine of papal infallibility. Yep. Prior to that time, there were all sorts of people who opposed that. They yeah, you had uh, the, the, the ultramontanists who thought the Pope was infallible in every single thing he said, which was wrong. Then you had the extreme on the other side, the Gallicans, who basically said the Pope had authority, but they actually didn't believe he had authority. So, uh, yeah, th there were some there were some heresies. You had the Ultramont. Of course, James White probably doesn't even know who these people are. Um, in fact, St. Francis de Sales, in his book, The Catholic Controversy, he argues for papal infallibility almost, with almost identical wording to Vatican I. In fact, I think a lot of people think Vatican I got their wording from him. Either way, if they did or not, that's irrelevant. But the point is, he essentially lays out Vatican I. And he admits Honorius was a heretic. How could you do that? Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Opposed it because, for example, they could look at history. Oh, guess what? I've looked at history, too. I mean... Uh, yeah, and see, and the the thing is, th th this is not even the best argument against the papacy out there. It's actually a really bad argument. In fact, I'll tell you what the best argument against the papacy is. I still think I can r refute it, but I'll tell you the best later. Anyway, continue. And they could, uh, well, demonstrate, for example, the papacy was incapable of healing itself of the Babylonian captivity of the church in the 14th century? Well, no, because the, 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 the popes in Avignon were, were false popes. I'll tell you why. Because when they went back to Rome to elect a new pope, I think it was 1378, they elected the Archbishop of Bari. And then some cardinals didn't like that, so they go back to Avignon and elect their own pope. That's a, that's a false pope. Now, they claim the conclave was under duress. No more than usual, you know. It was this stupidity of hanging out in Avignon for half a century that screwed things up. And into the 15th century. Oh, yes. And that the popes had, the various popes had anathematized each other between Avignon and France. The one pope anathematized the antipope, and the antipope 
tried to anathematize, but he had no power because he was an anti-pope, the legitimate pope. Uh, in Rome, I'm sorry, Avignon in, in Rome. And that uh, there had even ended up being a third pope, briefly. Uh, th there was actually uh, uh, three popes early, early in the 11th century before the reform popes came along. So it's not new. Of, of course, there's no three popes. There's one pope and two anti-popes. But James White just calls it three popes. There's three popes. No, there's one pope. There's two. The, there's a ton of anti-popes alive today. How come James White isn't using them? There's a guy named Pope Michael, calls himself Pope Michael, in the States. Now, if if all the Catholics in the States, I don't know how many Catholics there are, 50 million, they decide to break with Francis and join up with Pope Michael, that wouldn't make him, Pope Michael, any more legitimate than he is now. And just because they had kingdoms behind them, it was normally for political purposes. And and guys, I, I want to know, can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me clearly? Because I think the volume on my mic, can you hear me better now? Sh show me a one if you can hear me well. Show me a zero if it's not that well in the comments. Thank you. Anyway, we're back. As well. Uh but some people would say, well, it wasn't necessarily teaching or doctrine, but I would personally think that it's pretty obvious if you anathematize somebody, you have to have a doctrinal basis for doing that. And there were other arguments to be made, but the strongest argument that anyone could come up with... No, not the strongest. ...was the story of Honorius. No, 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 n not even close. It, it looks strong on the surface, but obviously it's a house of cards. Um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you the best story against, uh, the best argument against v v Vatican I right now. I'll tell you the best story, uh, story, the best argument against Vatican I. Pope Vigilius, that's your best argument. Pope Vigilius is your best argument against Vatican I. I still think I can re refute it, but I have a tougher time refuting it than the Pope Honorius. <laughs> the Pope Honorius is like... And most Protestants don't know about it because most Anglican scholars don't bring it up. And, and they get all these arguments from the 19th century Anglicans like Salmon and that. Pope Vigilius, I talked to Eric Ibarra. He agrees with me. In fact, he told me that. That's their best argument. Uh, so most Protestants don't use Pope Vigilius. And most Eastern Orthodox use him incorrectly. So <laughs> they give us an easy time. But, I mean, th th that's the best they got. Pope Honorius is not even close. The story of Honorius. Oh, yes. Now, I won't have time today to go overly deeply into it. If you wish to read about it, you can take about seven, eight pages from Schaff's history. There you go. Philip Schaff, that's where he gets everything. He doesn't read the primary sources. He goes right to Philip Schaff. The Church, Volume 4, pages 500 to 507, if you would like to look them up. But Ooh. let me just run through an outline of the history, and then let's think, well, let, let's, let's put ourselves in history, all right? Get plugged into this the This is a dispute about whether Christ has one or two wills. <sighs> You might say it's a dispute over whether you can have a true human person who does not have a will. Or whether a will is properly definitional of any human person. Hurry up. Hurry up. So did Jesus, who is one person with two natures, is a will definitional of each of the natures, and therefore oh, wow. he has two wills, a divine, the, the divine will Could of the Son. he talk any slower? And the human will I of don't the think he can talk any slower unless he's nature like Tobias That Singer. is taken in the incarnation. Or there is only one will. So duothelitism, monothelitism. Now... If you wanted to know what was true... Okay, I'm going to pause it and answer a very good question. 
Why is it that White only reads Anglo-Protestant historians and not any others? What about Baronius or the primary sources or German historians of the 19th century, but he only mentioned Schaff? Because he doesn't think we're worth reading. That's what I had to guess. He hasn't read the primary documents. He doesn't need to. He knows it's just a bunch of crazy Romanist nonsense. Therefore, I'm going to read uh, Schaff. Yeah, he'll tell me something. You know what I say to that? Screw Schaff. Don't read Schaff. Anyway, James White, the cool guy passer that rides a motorcycle and has arm sleeve tattoos. Well, Schaff is Swiss, but you get my point. Why? What did I say about him? I say he was German or English or... Anyway, I'll just continue. True. On this subject, during the papacy of Honorius, how could you have known the truth? How could you have known the papacy before Honorius? Or a hundred years prior, or two hundred years before that. How do you know the truth? And Honorius' stuff was private correspondence. It's not like he was making a, like an ex cathedra decree. It's not like when Pope uh, Pope Felix excommunicated Acacius. That was like a universal church wide condemnation. But uh, anyway, because let, let's be honest. Oh yes. Um, sit down here a second. Let's be honest. Um, Let, let's see if he's going to be honest here. You're not going to be able. Um, you're not going to be able to go to the writings of the second, third, fourth century because they're really not discussing this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, they're really not. They're really not talking about this particular subject and so it's also not a if, if you want to come up with biblical texts there aren't many there aren't many so how would you know well roman catholics tell us well we have the teaching magisterium of the church we can go to the pope okay. we can go to the pope so if you picked up Honorius's letters written as the Bishop of Rome. No, well, well yeah, r written a private letter to Sergius. And yes, it was the wrong theological doctrine. But it's a private letter. It's not like you can go up to uh, the patriarchal see in Constantinople and say, show me the letters of the Pope. To Sergius. But even if you could, perhaps these letters are more widespread than I thought, but I don't think they were. But he did teach error, but I'm going to answer that soon. And you discover that he is amenable to Sergius's view on this subject, and that is that he holds to monothelitism. Would it be safe for you to follow the theological perspectives expressed by the Bishop of Rome when he's writing as the Bishop of Rome to the Patriarch of Constantinople. No, because that's an onyx cathedra. Or to any and it's unfortunate because he didn't make a mistake. The other religious leader. Would that be a safe thing for you to do? You can see the relevance today. You can see the relevance today, because if you ask the question, what does the Roman Catholic Church teach today? Same thing that's always taught. Um, you can't just simply say, well, look at the Universal Catholic Catechism, because Why not? it's painfully obvious that Francis... Why not? So, so, see, here, let's keep going. ...introduces a new context that was not there with John Paul II. Was not no, because popes don't change the faith. Popes don't change the faith at all. They may clarify something that's a bit m murky. That's what Honorius was trying to do but he failed but yeah no that it's the same catechism it's not like pope francis has said all right we're gonna take uh, that catechism out of circulate now now the, the the catechism is not infallible 
it can be changed. But it's not like Pope Francis is like, all right, we got to take it out of circulation now. I'm the Pope, and I'm different than Benedict and John Paul, so I'm going to have the Francis Catechism. No, he hasn't done that. The Catechism is the uh, exact same. There with Benedict XVI, Ratzinger. Yeah, no, I, I, I pointed this out. If it starts at Lateran four, that means Francis of Assisi was born into some non-Catholic church, and then, boom, he dies in the Roman Catholic church. And somehow he doesn't notice the difference. I mean, people notice the difference when it went from in England, when it went from Catholic to Anglican, people noticed the difference, even under Henry. Although less people noticed it, but they noticed it. You've heard of the pilgrimage of grace, the rising of the north. They knew their faith was being changed. That's why there were rebellions against this stuff. They knew there was a change. Not like uh, Francis of Assisi. Whoa, th this wasn't the church I was born into. You know, that... That, that's why and so obviously those written documents in the Roman Catholic system now take on a different hue, a different cast. I mean, if this is his understanding, it's, it's a reason why he hasn't come to the true faith. Than they had before. So you're in a similar situation. I've heard him quote Denzinger before, but he, he's quoting so he in has the 7th century, if you had followed Honorius... Would that have been a safe thing to do? Or did you have any... Popes can say incorrect things. I don't know. He probably is mistaken. He wants it to be, be ultramontanism. He's not steel manning his opponent. He's straw manning here. Any, could papal infallibility function in any meaningful fashion? Yes, it did. In helping you? Yeah. In making a decision on... Because he wasn't speaking infallibly, and they knew that at the time, as reflected in Agatho's letter. And let me tell you something. Let me uh, just go back to me here. Because of the ambiguity, they had this council. They had the Lateran Council of 649 to clear up anything. And look, look, the, this over 400 pages long. Has James White actually read this? Has James White read the Lateran Council? No, he hasn't. He's too busy reading Schaff and Salmon and all these other clowns. No, he doesn't read. He doesn't read the Relatio. He doesn't read the Witcher book. I'm just kidding. This is the book, the novel I'm reading now, the Witcher. It's the last one before the standalone novel. I'm just joking with that. He probably hasn't read that, though, so that is true. However... Hey, Hallie. He's not reading these books. He is not reading these books. He's re he's too big. Schaff is all you need. You don't need to read the primary documents. You need Schaff. You need Schaff. You need Salmon. You need non-primary sources. You need modern Protestants or else you can't learn history. All right. Let's go. All right. Where were we here? All right. So uh, let's go back to here. On this doctrine. Hmm. Well, Honorius taught as the Bishop of Rome, speaking on a matter of doctrine, in two letters to Sergius, the mono. Not to the entire church, w which is what you need for an ex cathedra. Uh... heresy, which was condemned. By the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Oh, long before that the Lateran. For, for, it was condemned at Lateran, the the thing I just showed you, the council I just showed you, which James White hasn't read. He probably doesn't even know about that council. <laughs> Sola Shaftura. <laughs> oh, God bless you, Matthews or Matthias. I don't know how to pronounce your name. God bless you. That's that's great. That's great. Um. All right. Let's say you die before the Sixth Ecumenical Council takes place. Lateran. Lateran. And you...
What happens if you died in 324 and you didn't have the right answer between homo usios and homo usios? What do you do? Whoa! No, it's not binding on your soul until something specifically defined. Anathemas uh, or, or condemnations like that aren't retroactive. You follow Honorius's lead then you follow his lead into heresy. Yeah, but then, uh, let's see, he published that letter, I believe, in 635. So by 649, it's all taken care of. Lateran. But James White doesn't know about Lateran. He, he doesn't read it. He he reads Schaff, and he reads, uh, who else? Salmon. And, uh, yeah, not the sources. An ecumenical council, that of Constantinople, held in AD 680, condemned and excommunicated Honorius. Amen. Quote, the former Pope of old Rome, end quote, as a heretic. Yep, he was. This condemnation was repeated by the 7th and 8th ecumenical councils. Why? Yeah, what's the big deal about that? Hmm. Now, listen to this. This is, this is what... The following popes, all the way down to the 11th century, in a solemn oath taken at their succession to the papal chair. So, in other words, when they're being sworn in as the vicar of Christ on earth, the bishop of Rome... They endorsed the Sixth Ecumenical Council's condemnation of Honorius. These popes had to pronounce an eternal anathema, oh. not a, well, we disagree with his conclusions, or who am I to say? No, an eternal anathema on the authors of the monothelite heresy together with Pope Honorius. Yeah. Because he had given aid and comfort yeah. to the perverse doctrine. Oh, my computer is lagging here. Doctrines of the heretics. Every pope. Yeah. All the way down to the 11th century for hundreds of years had to anathematize one of their successors as a heretic. Yawn. So, three centuries publicly and openly recognized. An yeah, exactly. And we also agree that the paper, it says in Pope Agatho's letter, I, I can't bring it up because I lag if I bring it up. I should have got this ready. But did you know, James White? Well, he does know that Luke twenty two thirty two, faith will not fail, that famous verse, is applied to the Pope in Agatho's letter. So the, pap uh, the, 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 the faith won't fail and the path has never erred. It says that in the letter. But if it's never erred, what about Honorius? Well, they knew about Vatican I back then, so he wasn't speaking infallibly. They knew he wasn't speaking infallibly. Private letters aren't infallible. Thank you. This only impresses someone who hasn't read that much on this issue. Yeah, that's true. He hasn't read Francis de Sales, and he also hasn't read this, the Lateran Synod 649. Anyway, yeah, no, he's trying to shock Catholics, trying to destroy their faith. And, and and by the way, I've talked to many Catholics who became Protestants in the 90s or early 2000s because of James White, but have come back because they realized that uh, they got um, snowed. They got snowed by shallow arguments like he's trying to give right now. 
that he hasn't improved for 20 years. And Jenna shredded him on this. And he had all he's ever said is, whoa, his argument contradicted Tim Staples. Yeah, Staples was wrong. Ecumenical Council could and did condemn a pope for heresy. Yeah, we know. You catching this? No, I'm not. Say it again. How many Roman Catholics who would profess belief in papal infallibility are even aware of this? Even know Probably none, because, well, v v very few, because sadly Catholics don't know much these days. But. Now, remember, we've done debates on this. That you didn't do too well in. And... If I recall correctly, the two debates we did this were within one year of each other. I think they were. Six months. One with Tim Staples and one with Robertson Jenis. By the way, the Tim Staples debate, he calls him out. Uh, he, he's quoting Pope Sozomen. No, not Pope. He's quoting the church historian of the 4th and 5th century, Sozomen. He's like, by the way, I, I'm actually quoting an early church historian, not a 19th century Protestant, because James White was just quoting his 19th century stuff again. And they defended Honorius in two completely different ways. Tim Staples tried to come up with excuses for Honorius. And Bob Sagena said, yep, even heretics can be popes. <laughs> So there you go. And St. Genesis was right. There are heretical popes. They just won't teach dogmatically or lead the church into error on error. So like people like Canorius, John the 22nd, Francis. Um, yeah, th there are heretics that can be in the office of, of Peter, in Peter's chair. Throne of Peter, as um, they say it in the third century controversy. But... Um, Yeah, and, and Protestants have d d different uh, views on things as well, but James White does not know that either. Um, said of a Cantus White. Yeah, yeah so yeah, because James White, unless it's Philip Schaff, he hasn't read you. Um, also, popes for three centuries admitted that the Sixth Ecumenical Council had rightly condemned Pope Honorius for heresy. Well, yeah, because ecumenical councils aren't wrong on anything. So, obviously, what was in the council was right, and popes believed that at the time. Frustrating. This is important for some of attempted to defend Honorius by saying he was wrongly accused or condemned, which is what Staples did. Yeah, and Staples was wrong. Which does the modern Roman Catholic position a little good, for it then makes the popes of the next three centuries guilty of error in their very oaths of succession to the chair of Peter. Yeah, I agree. That's dumb. So who are you going to defend? Who was right? Who was wrong? The council was right. This is why so many people... Let me take a drink, too. ...simply did not believe that papal infallibility would ever be seriously considered. No, but... but... But, but keep in mind, back in the, the, the 1860s, it's like, what exactly is papal infallibility? By the way, there's a good book by Cardinal Manning. He wrote a book before the council and a book after the council. His book before the council where he goes to defend papal infallibility is great. In fact, hold on. I'm taking a look at my bookshelf. One, yeah, sorry. I will find you the book you want to read. Um... Let me just, here's the book you want to read, The Ecumenical Council and the Infallibility of the Roman Pontiff. This is what you want to read. This is, this is actually a Catholic talking about this stuff. I know James White's like, well, it's not Schaff, so I don't know if I can trust it, or it's not Salmon, or it's not some other anti-Catholic Protestant, so I can't trust it. You know, Shouldn't we have the right to define our own doctrine, Dr. White? What about this? You haven't read this either. You haven't read anything by us Catholics, but you're more than willing to read Schaff. Schaff. Anyway, let's get back to his thing. Because of the history of the church itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the history. Pope Leo II confirmed the acts of the Sixth Council. 
Amen. And said in a letter that Honorius was one who, quote, endeavored by profane, profane treason to overthrow the immaculate faith of the Roman Church, end quote. Yeah. The same pope wrote to the Spanish bishops and said, quote, with eternal damnation, have we have punished Theodorus, Cyrus, Sergius, together with Honorius, who did not extinguish at the very beginning the flame of heretical doctrine, as was becoming his apostolic authority, but nursed it by his carelessness. As one writer concluded, quote, yet in every case, the decisive fact remains that both councils and popes for several hundred, year, several hundred years believed in the fallibility of the pope in flat contradiction to the Vatican Council. No, no, that's not true. Well, yeah, the, the, the pope's fallible almost all the time. Just like Pope Honorius was back in the day. Oh, man. Oh, man. Some people. I, I, I mean, again, he needs to read the Relatio. He needs to read Manning. Such acts of violence upon history remind one of King James's short method with dissenters. Only hang them. That's all. End quote. As opposed to hang, drawn, and quarter. So, here's, here's the, the point in making modern application of this historical reality. No, here it comes. Um, most of us are not debating monothelitism today. Uh, you, can, you can see why it's problematic in the sense that it would seemingly inevitably lead to a form of Apollinarianism. I don't think that. I think it's just trying to bring in monophysitism by stealth. That's what I think it is. Because the human nature of Christ would have no will. And so... Well, no, I think the teaching that the monothelites are trying to bring is the will comes from the union, not the individual persons. Oh, anyway. If you remember Apollinarianism, you, you have the two natures, but there's a, there's a part of the human nature that is replaced by the Logos. So you, you have sort of a... That's true. That's what Apollinarianism is, but I don't think that's the danger. I think it, you, you just monophysites, you know. Zombie Jesus. <laughs> um, taken over by a part of the Logos. Instead of two complete natures in the hypostatic union. And so would Honorius have gone that far? I don't know. Probably not. But the v video is almost done, but I'm going to take it down because you get the point. It, it, it's been shredded and there's no point responding to the rest of it. So I'm going to take questions now. If anyone has questions, let me know. And uh, then I'll get on and I'll read some more of The Witcher. This is a great series, by the way, guys. The Witcher. And I uh, and then there's there's two collections of short stories, five novels. This is the fifth, and there's a standalone novel. I'm trying to read these both before the end of the month. So um, yeah, so if you have any questions, put them down there, and I'll answer this. Otherwise, I'll kill the stream. I've loved this first uh, the the pilot episode of Shred Hour. I have many other ideas on the chopping block. Who's next? in shred hour. All right, questions please. Let me just go. Uh he's the uncle in Napoleon ah uh, that's How much do I read? That's a good question. I read probably on average 2 hours a day and I'll tell you when. I read an hour at home every night and I read um Normally an hour at work. I have an hour off for work. I eat lunch in five minutes and then I read. We, you know, I might as well spend the time reading. Uh, do you think that infallibility applies to definitions and condemnations like the syllabus of errors? I don't believe it applies to the syllabus of errors, although that's a very authoritative document. There are infallible things in there, but I don't believe that document is necessarily infallible. Um, any more questions? Let me just take a, a glass of water here. Oh. 
starting to get cold here up north. I live in Canada. It's pretty cold. Oh, by the way, on Wednesday, guys, at 7 p.m. Pacific time, uh, I'm getting together with a couple of my friends on this channel, and we are going to shred a book. It might be a shred hour. Uh, no, because I've already created the, the video for it. But Michael Corrin, his book, Michael Corrin, The Apostate, his book, The Rebel Christ. We are going to destroy this book. And on the book, look, he has an endorsement from Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry. Integrity, wit, and passion. A fine advocate for the best of Christian thought. St Stephen Fry, guys. A guy who hates Christianity, who's uh, an active homosexual, who's quote-unquote married to someone half his age. That's That's who Michael Korn's getting endorsed by. That should say something. Like, if you're a pro-life activist and Planned Parenthood is endorsing you, what does that say? Anyway, uh, how many ex cathedra statements do you think have been made? I don't know, really. I don't know. I've not ever taken the time to count them. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. They're not too often. Father James, we just had, uh, it, it's a shame you couldn't join us. We were doing Shred Hour, where we were shredding James White's uh, condemnate, uh, trying to use Pope Norris against papal infallibility, and we shredded it, Shred Hour, hence Shred Hour. There you go. There's the answer. Oh, by the way, <laughs> Gasser's Relatio. I recommend it to all. I know F Father James has read this book. And that's good on you, Father James. It's F Father James, if you go back and watch this, I was demonstrating how White hadn't read this book at all. You can't find it on his website. You type Gasser into his website. And you can't find it. Like I said, if I was criticizing communism and I hadn't read the Communist Manifesto, it's pointless, right? You know, what kind of anti-communist am I? Alan Rule destroys James White with facts and logic. By the way, um, Father James, r r right before you came, I gave a plug for our upcoming video on Wednesday where this baby's getting shred. The Rebel Christ. We're going to shred Michael Corrin because Michael Corrin is a rebel against Christ. How is that true? Well, you got to tune into our hour next Wednesday, starring me, starring Barely Protestant here, Father James, and uh, our good friend John Fisher 2.0. And uh, yeah, no, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. All right. So we got seven more minutes. I'm going to kill the stream at the hour. So, ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I read more of it uh, today. My eyes only stopped bleeding just now. I, I'm, I'm curious, Father James, how far are you, you into uh, th th this book? In fact, I'll give a preview. There's a, uh, a piece of scripture I'm going to quote in this book. It's, it's actually one of the most powerful passages of scripture from the gospels. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it exposes, it exposes what uh, Corin tries to do in the first chapter. In the first chapter, I don't know if I should spoil this. This is too good material. J just a few chapters. Well, I don't think there's that many chapters in the book. There's, there's four chapters in the whole book. I think there might be a, uh, uh, there's four chapters, then there's a last word. And uh, we know, how do I get a hold of Mansi? I don't know. I don't own Mansi. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Just search online, I guess. I'm sure there's PDFs available. Either way, it's not cheap. But... You, you should try to get the stuff that you, um, oh, okay. All right. You, you, 
I do got to agree. It's a painful, read. it's a short read though. It's only 140 pages or something. So, uh, no, but I, oh man, I can't wait for this review. I am looking forward to this review on Michael Corn. Oh man, it's so good. All right. Uh, are there any more questions? Then I'll kill the stream. I'm thinking of how, like I said, this was the pilot episode of Shred Hour. So hopefully, nice. There will be more Shred Hours coming up. The one thing I'm scared about is if, if I have too many files going, it lags. Like I was trying to search up something on new admin and it lags the stream. I don't want that to happen again. So I, I got to be more careful. I'm, uh, so I'm going to be a bit more, a bit more careful next time. Make sure I have all the quotes downloaded on a, a, a word document before I go live. Um, j just to make sure, cause when you have three things open, cause it's got my stream. I had this fact is he was video. condemned with the need. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And then I had a, a third tab open where I was searching up, uh, some 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 ecumenical council document all right so that looks like uh, it's all there's oh you mention uh the sales does he talk about infallibility in the controversy yes he does yes he does uh in fact if you go to my w w website alanrule.com i can't remember the name of the article but i quote it there uh, yes, it, it's in there. I, I can't tell you the exact, uh, here, hold on. L let me go to my website, alanrule.com. Um, sales infallibility and sister sales. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. All right. Now, um, okay. I am going to, okay. Let me put this in the comments. Oh, by the way, Father James, I talked about Pope Michael earlier in the stream. <laughs> so uh, you'll have to go back and rewatch because we did talk about Pope Michael. Rules for shredding. So, yeah, check out that article. I respond to Ken Temple, who that's an old article. It was written in. It's a long article. It was written in uh, like 2017, I think. And yeah, like I, I give the quotes from Francis Sales in there. Um, in fact, I'll quote it here. I'll see how much time I have left. We got two minutes left. So uh, let me uh, quote it. Um, it says, quote, so everything. Uh, okay, he, he says, Thus, we do not say that the Pope cannot err in his private opinions, as did John the Twenty Second, or be altogether a heretic, as perhaps Honorius was. Then he says later down, quote, So everything the Pope says is not canon law or of legal obligation. He must mean to define and to lay down the law for the sheep, and he must keep the due order and form. Thus we say that we must appeal to him not as to a learned man, for in this he is ordinarily surpassed by some others, but as to the general head and pastor of the church. And as such, we must honor, follow, and firmly embrace his doctrine, for then he carries on his breast the Urim and Thummim doctrine and truth. And again, we must not think that in everything and everywhere his judgment is infallible, but then only when he gives judgment on a matter of faith and questions necessary to the whole church, for in particular cases which depend on human fact, he can err. There is no doubt, though it is not for us to uh, control him in these cases, save with reverence, submission, and direction. Theologians have said in a word that he can err in questions of fact, not in questions of right, that he can err 
extra cathedrum outside of the chair of Peter that is as a private individual by writings and bad example. But he cannot err when he is in cathedra, that is, when he intends to make an instruction and decree for the guidance of the whole church when he means to confirm his brethren as supreme pastor and to conduct them into the uh, pastors of the faith, close quote. See, that is papal infallibility right there. 200 years prior, about 200 and about two, 300 years before the Vatican I definition, they knew, they knew about papal infallibility. Now, th there were people that didn't believe in it. Ultramontanists, the, 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 the Gallicans, and the Gallicans were bef before when people thought they started. That's, uh, anyway, but the point is, go check that article on my website, and you can also uh, um, find it in his book, the controversies, great book, by the way, N not just on the papacy, but talks on a ton of issues. It's got 30 pages or so on purgatory. It's a great book. All right. I've already gone longer than I've intended. I'm going to go read this book, the Witcher's uh, series, the lady of the lake. I'm going to go read this book now, but thank you everyone for joining in me. God, uh, joining me today. God bless you all. And, uh, Gallican should have won the day. We might all might have all been won now. Okay, well, th th that's interesting, Father James, because in uh, this book by Cardinal Manning, the Ecumenical Council and the Infallibility of the Roman Pontiff, he talks about G Gallicanism and he talks compares it to Anglicanism, actually. And he says that Gallicanism is more dangerous than Anglicanism because Anglicanism makes it clear the Pope has no authority in England, right? That's what the Anglican Church says. But but what the contrast with the Gallicans who said, yeah, the Pope has authority here, but they ignored the Pope. They did their own thing. He had authority on paper, but in practice, he didn't have any authority. So, yeah, no, and that is... For, that, that had to do see i don't like when politicians get their hands into the church i know uh that that that's pretty much how anglicanism was started with henry the eighth and you know eventually edward the sixth getting involved in the uh church <laughs> i'm so proud of it yeah uh and so yeah so th that's why uh we cannot go with Gallicanism. Now, although Gallicanism, as he points out, existed far earlier than the 16 and 1700s, it goes back to the 1500s. In, in fact, I think it's in this book. I could be wrong. I think it's in this book, but it says somewhere, yeah, ex exactly, uh, King Philip IV. Uh, it says somewhere in this book that the whole reason, the count, like for example, You've got Vatican I, and you have Trent, which came 300 years earlier. Why? Do, I think it's this book that says, I can't remember. I've not read this book in some time. Why didn't the Council of Trent tackle the whole papal issue? Why? They could have. Um, they, they didn't tackle it because... There was wars where Catholics on both, there were Catholic nations on both sides. The King of France was getting pretty Gallican, King um, whoever, it was Francis. Francis I, not Pope Francis, but King Francis of um, Francois of uh, France, was attacking. The, the whole reason Protestantism got off the ground is Charles V had no power at home because he was trying to fight a two front war. He had the Turks on one side harassing him and the French on the other. So each time he defeat the Turks, it's like, Oh, the Turks, I can finally deal with the French. Oh, I dealt with the French. Now I can suppress Martin L L Luther. Oh, the Turks are attacking again. Okay. Oh, the French are attacking again. And he had no power because he was fighting all these two front wars. And that's what happened. I love how Vatican I is considered the moderate view. 
Yeah, there's the moderate view. The liberals won at Vatican I. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, no. Uh, anyway, uh, I've gone longer than I wanted to, and we're only down to, we, we've only got seven viewers. But God bless you all. Thanks for watching. There will be more shred streams and there or shred hour sorry and on wednesday this is going down god bless you all have a good evening pray the rosary read the bible and have love for our lord jesus christ the only way you can get to the father is through the son and god bless